And he gets back on the phone and he said, what did you say your name was? <laughs> and I said, Arthur Kurzweil. And he said, your name isn't Kurzweil, your name is Kurzweil. Uh-huh. Now, to me, it's not such a big leap. But to him, it was, like a, it was a different name. And suddenly, I heard the way my name was pronounced for generations and generations. And just, you know what, what the name, how my grandfather was, was called. So when I realized that there was this um, government society, I said to the guy, Philip, is, is there, do you still have the Dunmail Society? He said, yes, we do. Uh, you know, we used to meet every month. Now we meet once a year. <laughs> he said, and the main order of business every year is to announce to the membership who passed away since last year's meeting. <laughs> but he said to me, you know, in about six weeks, we're going to have our annual meeting, and it's going to be in a hotel in Manhattan. And why don't you come? So I, I, I wrote down the information, and, and the day came six weeks later, and I went into the hotel, up to the room, and when I walked into the room, there was a bunch of old elderly people uh, sitting there. I walk in, and they look at me, and they say, you're in the wrong room. <laughs> and I said, is this a double mill society? And they said, yes, who are you? Well, by that time, I knew who I was. <laughs> <laughs> it was Arthur Kurzweil. <laughs> Oh, well, the store, they greeted me, they knew my parents, they knew my, uh, my grandparents, they knew my, uh, my great-grandparents. Well, the meeting begins. You know, I, I once asked my father, what do, you, what do they do at those meetings? <laughs> and my father said, what, they fight. <laughs> <laughs> so the meeting begins, the president of the organization gets up and says, I would like to begin this year's meeting by introducing a guest. He was about to introduce me, and the guy in the third row gets up and says, that's new business. <laughs> and they started to fight. Right? So, I, so my father was right, but, but I want you to know that in, in, the middle, in the middle of the meeting, a 93-year-old man tapped me on the shoulder and said to me, I played the fiddle at your grandparents' wedding. Aww. So I suddenly realized I knew why I had gone there that day, to speak to that 93-year-old man who played the fiddle at, at, my, at my grandparents' wedding. This is a demonstration of the, the importance of diversity. This is a tepary bean. It's a, um, it's a bean from the southwest. It's a different species from common beans. But it's, uh, it's incredibly resistant to drought. And, um, <laughs> This one is from the Paiute people in uh, southern Utah, and they call it Paiute Mixed, or that's, that's how we got it. So I grew up in Jenkintown, uh, north of Philadelphia. This is not my uh, Jewish community, but I, I am Jewish, and my professional background is not in agriculture until recently, but it's always been a passion of mine, and um, I've been interested in particular in, uh, in seed. But uh, tepary beans have been studied recently, the, the, the International Repository for Beans is in Colombia, and they did, a, they did some research recently to find which of the beans in their collection were able to produce when there's hot nights, because most beans require a cooler night in order to set seed, in order for pods to develop from the flowers. And um, the, uh, they found almost none that can actually handle hot nights, and as the climate changes, we're going to get more and more hot nights. Uh, but there are 20 accessions of tepary bean that can handle it. So one day, these may be, these may be crossed with you know, all of the common beans that we eat, the kidney beans, the cannellini beans, lima beans, in order to, in order to maintain beans as a crop that we can, uh, that we can eat. Well, in the wintertime, he's not doing much. That's sort of a, that's a play. <laughs> This is Jay Greenblatt, everybody. <laughs> Longtime community <laughs> member. In this area, yeah. there is no Jewish community to speak of. This is the cemetery of the area. It's still being used. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness, yes. I've been on the board here for many years.
put together a lot of old people from the area because this was, it was deserted, this area. When I walked into that synagogue, it was totally deserted, except there were four Torahs in there. Wow. And the front door was being held together with a piece of rope. I got a rabbi, we got the Torahs out. I had the Beautiful. ark removed. I had the bima removed. This is, this is the ark from there. Here it is. I formed a foundation, a, a uh, trust. I took the money, invested the money, dedicated it to the maintenance of this chapel as a memorial to the Alliance Colony. So the money that was used is now in trust for uh, the maintenance of this building. We just used it to put a new roof on it this, this summer. Then I realized it's going to be 100 years. So I organized a committee and we got in touch with many, many of the uh, descendants of the settlers of the area and we collected uh, the documents and pictures and so forth that depict the life of the time. We had 600 people who were direct descendants of settlers of the area. When I say settlers, I don't mean the pioneers. There were 43 original families. And uh, in addition, those people who came shortly thereafter were all considered pioneers. So we had 600 of them show up from as far away as Hawaii. Uh, it was a nice, beautiful Sunday, and people were coming in from Philadelphia looking for something to do. Uh, and it was beautifully done. Mr. Brockman, who is here, who was there today, he was the son of Stanley Brockman, the United States District Court Judge, who was the grandson of the founder of Rotmanville, which is the synagogue down at the end of the street. As I like to tell people, like, uh, like uh, when I was a kid, we'd go on the boardwalk in Atlantic City and get hermit crabs. Hermit crabs would grow, and, and then they the leave the one. shell, and they go to another shell. Right. And that's what happened. We had an influx then of another survivors of Jewish, uh, of anti-Semitism. And uh, just a different part of the world they came from. And then uh, it became a sleepy area again as their children grew up and went to school. The, the number of people in the first generation that were born in Alliance Colony who became extremely successful is amazing. Uh, so uh, we just had the presentations done. People are starting to make their way. And um, in the little museum that Jay Greenblatt set up, there's a uh, picture of a survey of the Line Cemetery. And the grave that I thought was Jacob Ekoff was not listed as Jacob Ekoff, it was listed as somebody else. But there was another Ekoff somewhere else, and I'm gonna find them. And right here is my third great grandmother. This is the grave of Rebecca Ekoff. You can just barely make it out. One thing I need to do is I need to do what's called the tinfoil trick, which is supposed to help you be able to read it. And uh, on this stone, I'd imagine that it will say her father's name. Over this direction, there's supposed to be an ekoff. Or maybe one of these. It's in only Hebrew. When you, when you acquire something, you can uh, hand something to someone else and that signifies the deal is made. But when you buy real estate or a field, you can't uh, hand it to someone. So there's a Jewish, a Talmudic uh, tradition of walking the perimeter of land to officially acquire it. So when Molly and I were acquiring this land, we walked all the way around this field. It took way longer than we thought it, took it would. a long we walked time. All the way around all of this, several hours, um, but deer, uh, right. are abundant and dart as close as I am to you and, and I was joking I was like we should start farming deer here and uh, make this deer central um, it's something that seemed to pique your curiosity <laughs> I don't know if it's so pr practical but let's go just to the end of this field so we can see Nate's work and then, uh, 
middle field over here? Middle field. There's the middle field. And then the one where he's pulling in is little field. Um, this property here, it's residential. Um, it, it, it acts as um, pertinent woodland. It helps protect the borders of the field. All the bushes here and along the perimeter, many of them are wild black raspberry bushes and um, dewberry bushes. It's just a nice surprise. We didn't realize we picked bushels of berry here. We can peek in here. This is another parcel that was not part of, the, uh, of our original acquisition, but this is an abandoned house. It's kind of spooky, so we need to raise this house um, in the next 50 days or so. Behind here, there is evidence that there used to be uh, a chicken uh, farming going on here. Um, you did, you could probably assess better than I, but there were about seven big uh, concrete slabs with chicken wiring and wood roofs and uh, wells at each uh, concrete slab. They're all torn down. And uh, one bit of information, I think, uh, uh, Jared, if I'm correct, is this the property you believe belonged to your ancestors? Yeah, I believe it, it started because the field there is technically two of properties. If yeah, I that's correctly. right. It's lot 15 and 16. Because I remember it goes the Yosef family, the Zager family, and then the Ekoff family. So this may be, this This house is 1948, so it wasn't your... We sold it, yeah, we yeah, sold it in the 20s or 30s, so 40s, this would have been after. But this is also adjacent to another family... Uh, the Dudas family, because you sent me the deed. Oh, yeah, yeah. This is the most interesting field. This is the one that's thriving. Um, it was the first experiment with uh, Nathan Kleinman, who was introduced to us by Nati Passau of the Jewish Farm uh, Network in uh, Farm School in Philadelphia. Um, so, Nathan, a second introduction. Nathan Kleinman, everybody. Howdy. <laughs> Take a little walk up. I can show you a few if you have things a if Nobody's got open-toed shoes, right? Oh, I do. Is that bad? No, you're fine. Just keep an eye out for those cow killer hands. Oh, okay. And starting about halfway through here, I'll, I'm, I'm going to ask everybody to walk right behind me so we don't, we don't step on a couple of inconspicuous plants. Uh, this is sorghum. This oh, is sorghum. that South Sudanese sorghum. Mm -hmm. um, it's all the same variety. It's a multi-use variety. And I gave a bunch of seed to a farmer in Vermont who does sorghum cane. We planted this late. It's supposed to be, the stalks are supposed to be bigger. Um, the seed heads are supposed to be bigger. All right, this is where I need everybody on the right side here because I've got, there's a plant sprawling out here that I don't want people to step on. It's this inconspicuous sprawling vine thing. You see the little fruit? It looks like a baby watermelon. That's as big as it's gonna get. Uh, and it's edible at that stage. It ripens to almost black. It's a perennial. It's called Melothria pendula, or Guadalupe cucumber. It grows in the Caribbean and so the southeast mainly. Um, but it is creeping up uh, from, from the south. There's a wild population in southern Delaware and another one in Ocean City, Maryland. This one actually came from a guy who grows it up in Massachusetts. And the, the, the fruit is bigger. I don't know where his accession came from originally, but... But is it not a tree? Or? It's a vine. Oh, it's a vine. Yeah. Mm. So we're probably, next year, we might plant a row of sorghum next to it or something, so it has something to climb up. But eventually, they'll probably spread to the hedgerow. It would be nice to get this growing here wild, competing with the invasive Japanese honeysuckle. And then the interesting stuff is back in here. You guys were shucking those cow peas. This is where the cow peas grew. These, this one's not quite dry, but it's probably not gonna ripen well anyway, so that I can demonstrate. This is also the best stage at which to eat them. You know, like two or three times the size of what they end up when they're fully, uh, when they're dry. So it's like eating like a lima bean or something. Um, you can eat them at this stage, it'd be like eating a pea, a little bit harder than a pea, but also might make you gassy. They probably don't taste so great now, but, like a sprout. but boiled and 
covered in butter and salt, and there's nothing better. These two are tartary buckwheat. They're the only two survivors. This was an experiment in what can we grow unirrigated here in this soil. And cow peas is one answer, sorghum is one answer, watermelon actually did okay. And this tartary buckwheat, we didn't have great germination, but um, I like the way the plants are growing. I like the upright form instead of the instead of growing wide. Um, we'll hopefully be growing a lot of this one soon. It's from this one's from China. And then this Kenaf hibiscus is also doing phenomenally well here. Can't complain at all about this, except that only one sprouted. The, the Latin name of this is uh, hibiscus cannabinum. It's because it looks just like cannabis. Uh, just like. It. Close enough. Pretty darn close, Pretty yeah. Close, yeah. But uh, the leaves are tasty. They have yeah. a lemony taste, a little bitter. Can I try? You, you want to try a small one, a newer one, or tastier than the older, bigger one. And if you're here in the morning, when these flowers are open, they're big, beautiful, like burgundy eyed um, hibiscus flowers. And yeah, there's the, that's the tree that has the grape growing up it that was delicious, a white, like, Niagara-type grape. And that has apparently been growing here since William was a, was a boy. And this was like the year of one plant. One Malothria, one Kena, one eggplant. That's better than that. To round up the, uh, the tour, this is our, this, we call this long field. It's only like a few feet wide, but it goes all the way it's a huge field um, that's... But how many acres is this field? I think, um, I think it's 12 acres. I think half of it is also our pertinent woodland. It uh, qualifies for farmland assessment because it benefits the fields. <laughs> Nate, God bless him, they, thought, they believed that, um, th that they would be doing all these fields this year, but uh, they soon realized that 48 acres of land is a lot to, to handle at one point. So they're, they're working their way down the fields and uh, hopefully we'll get to all of them by next year. And so you're leasing it to him or, or he's just doing it for you? Just want to test it. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. It started off as a test with this field. Yeah. And the lease um, is purely based on commission. Um, but it doesn't look like that will lead to, to much this year but it's more of a partnership in that way but we're open to suggestions i think they uh i think nate and dusty understand that we'll probably end up doing other things with various fields this was a attempt to explore one possible avenue yeah. keep going with the organic certification timeline all that yeah agritourism would be uh certainly a, a component of it we would hope it would be more uh, learning based, learning at the, at the synagogue. Um, more you know, learning le in the field. Learning. So I am on my way back home after an awesome weekend at the Alliance Community Reboot. William and Myla Levin hosted the event at their house. They're really wonderful hosts. Um, William is a descendant of two of the families of Alliance, the Levins and the Bayics. It was a really, really awesome weekend. Did some mushroom foraging, got to meet a lot of other descendants. I was able to do an interview with Myla's father, who is Rabbi Arthur Kurzweil. Um, he gave a really wonderful talk at the um, synagogue, the Alliance Synagogue, which was built by my family and the other families of Alliance in 1884 to 1886. It was great. It was really great. So I left last night uh, from Alliance and I went down to Fairfax, Virginia, got a nice hotel, was able to shower, get some pretty good sleep, and then um, just a nice quick drive today. So Thank yeah. you so much for checking out this video. If you enjoyed, please be sure to give it the thumbs up. You can also click right about here to subscribe, which it is free to subscribe. You can also check out my other videos of the Alliance Community Reboot series right here and right here. And be sure to follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Genie Vlogger. I'm the Genie Vlogger. I'm out.